Lipids are probably one of my least favourite topics in the overall section of biological molecules. They're not necessarily difficult, they're just annoying. As far as what we need to know, we need to know that there are two types, triglycerides and phospholipids. And on top of this, we need to know how they're formed and how they're structured. Formation's the easy part. Nine times out of ten, if you get asked in an exam, what forms this molecule, it's likely going to be condensation, as we've discussed previously. And it's the same in this case as well. I think it's also important to know how these structures look in a molecular scale in order to fully understand the condensation reaction that takes place here. So if we draw it up, you can see we have three fatty acid chains and a glycerol chain. The thing that makes glycerol such an important part of this molecule is that it is effectively the backbone of this molecule, where each of these OH parts can be condensed into water to form three separate areas where the fatty acids can connect. Now, if we look at this chain, it's important to realise that, in fact, unlike the previous structures that we've talked about, this lipid formation is actually a non-polymer. Instead, we would call this molecule a macromolecule. Even though we've got three or four different molecules, depending on how you're looking at it, combined together, they're not technically repeating units, so therefore we can't call it a polymer. Now, these fatty acids that we add to this glycerol are extremely important in defining the physical properties of the overall lipids that we're forming. If we visualise the carbon chain that these fatty acids make up, we can see that on the ends they have a functional group. Now, a functional group is simply a set of chemicals that give the overall molecule its chemical properties. In the case of fatty acid, this is a carboxylic acid, so it has a carboxylic group a C double bond O OH. Now, if you wanted to draw out a fatty acid, you would be extremely pressed because the length of these things can become extremely long. Even using skeletal formula, you'd still have a hard enough time getting to the end of it. So we usually represent these long, long, long carbon chains as R groups. And for that, we simply write R. And in the case of the triglyceride that we form, we write R1, R2, R3, and there you go. We can't fully discount this R, however. We have to realise whether it's a fully saturated R group or an unsaturated R group. If you remember what I said about physical properties, you can imagine that these structures are going to affect what physical properties this overall structure has. When a structure has three saturated fatty acids, we have a lipid that will become likely a solid. Now this is because of the forces between each of these layers. If we were to stack them on top of each other, you would find that these straight chains can fit almost perfectly on top of each other, just like building blocks. And it's the same at the molecular level. These strong brick-like layers will form a solid. Now, unsaturated simply means the presence of one or more double bonds between the carbons. Due to the uneven nature of the interactions between hydrogen atoms and carbon atoms, the structure will begin to bend at the tails of the fatty acid. This means when we try and stack them on top of each other, it's obviously going to be a lot harder and likely will not work. And as such, these lipids make up things like oil. When we look on a skeletal diagram and we see a double bond, that tells you instantly that that structure is likely going to become a liquid at room temperature. The other type of lipid was a phospholipid. Now, as we had our regular triglyceride before, we had three fatty acid groups connected to a glycerol. In the case of a phospholipid, one of these fatty acid tails has been replaced with a head of a phosphate group. These phosphate groups are usually charged, which gives the entire substance a charged head 
and a non-polar tail. Put the quotation marks in the wrong place there, but you get what I mean. The reason this is so good for survival of cells and cell membranes is that when we've got a charged, uncharged structure, it allows the substance to have an affinity with both water and oil. Affinity is simply how soluble something is in that substance. If we imagine our water molecule, we have a slightly negative charge on the oxygen atom and a slightly positive charge on both of the hydrogen atoms. An important thing to remember in any form of science is that like dissolves like. So if you have a charged substance, it will dissolve other charged substances and will not likely mix with any form of uncharged substance. If we go back to our triglyceride, for example, if you've ever seen on the roads where a puddle has been glazed over with oil, that's because the substance is not mixing with the water and is simply settling to the top. Whereas if the substance was a phospholipid, it would mix with the water and you would get a single layer on the top where the tails of the phospholipid were pointing upwards. And that happens on our skin, in fact, which is why we have a slightly waterproof skin layer and we don't just dissolve when it rains. Ugh. Now comes my least favourite test in all of biology, the emulsion test. Don't know why, I just hate this test. Now, in the previous test, we simply crushed up the solution. Whereas in this test, we have to not only crush it up, but dissolve it in alcohol. Ethanol has an affinity for both water and for lipids, which allows us to dissolve this substance fully if there are any lipids present. We then decant this, which is a process of transferring it that removes any sediment, and suspend it within water. Now, because ethanol has a higher affinity for water than it does with fat, all of the fat, as you shake it up, will begin to fall out of the solution and turn this entire water area, this strange milky cloudy colour. And because fats are usually less dense than water, you'll see it as you leave it to rest, slowly rise to the top of the mixture. And if you're still struggling, keep at it, because these areas come up all through biology, and if you can get these down, you can sit back and just enjoy the rest of it. That's why they tend to put this at the first part of the course, because it covers pretty much everything you need to know for the entire area of biology.